Payal, we're going to. Payal, we're going to start. All right. This is the moment. Lunch is officially over, people. Uh, my. My name is Patricia After Heidi. I'm really thrilled uh, to be here, and I want to thank the organizers of this of this conference. Um, I'm a co-host because we're here, and I uh, knew the right people to get us this room and that food. So you're welcome. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I am really excited about this panel. I want to introduce the people who are going to be presenting. They'll be presenting in the order uh, that it is in the in the schedule. Um, we're the, our first speaker will be Payal Aurora. She is an associate professor at Erasmus University, and she is an expert on internet and social media practices in developing in non-Western countries. And her latest book is titled appropriately, The Next Billion Users, Digital Life Beyond the West. Thomas Powell is a, se a senior lecturer in the new media and digital culture and program director of the research master uh, media studies at the University of Amsterdam. And his latest book is uh, edited with uh, two other people, and it's The Platform Society, Public Values in a Connective World. He's asking questions about how do we get public values into platforms that don't, uh, mostly do not foster them, something that will probably not come as a surprise to any of you. Uh, and Frank Pasquale is a professor of law at the University of Maryland here in this fair city. And, um, and is the author of a book called Black Box Society, The Secret Algorithms That Control Money and Information. And he's the guy who, long before the rest of us deleted Facebook, he was onto the concept of <laughs> algorithmic control and surveillance capitalism. So, Payel, uh, inaugurate this conference for us. Inaugurate this panel, I'm sorry. Yeah. All right, so um, how is this? Yes, all right. Uh, so yeah, I think my next book is going to be what about the other billion users and I hope the publisher will get that too. But um, yeah, so now my task is to wake you guys up and so it's an honor. Um, all right, so I'm going to be drawing from my recently published uh, paper, Benign Data Valence, Examining Novel Data-Driven Governance Systems in India and China. And it's part of a special issue that Hallam Stevens and I uh, came out with recently, and which is data-driven models of governance across borders. Lena has a wonderful piece in it too. And a little shout out to Zemke that, uh, because I wrote this piece uh, during my stay as a visiting scholar there, so thank you. So, okay, so that being said, let's get started. Um, so what I'm actually looking at is uh, comparing two of the most ambitious datafication systems uh, being implemented currently, one in India and China. Now, this is not just interesting because we're talking about 36% of the world's population living in these two contexts, but also the fact that these two contexts are actively exporting these datafied systems of governance to multiple regions around the world outside the West. So this has vast implications on how AI and social good are going to be shaped in the near future and what this means to all of us, right? As we seek for more equity, higher, better quality participation, inclusion, and the like. So for those who are not familiar with these systems, in a nutshell, what is the biometric identity system in India? It's basically creating a singular identity based on a convergence of iris scans, fingerprints, as well as your, any kind of information you have, which is in the traditional databases. And this has been touted as one of the most ambitious and really innovative datafied projects because it's bringing the vast undocumented population into the system. And mind you, this comes from a very div uh, different framework because we've been talking about datafication as oppressive, very pessimistic, you know, sort of like this moral panic about what is going to happen to society. But when you look at uh, Global South, we have to apply the development studies framework, which is really highly optimistic about new technologies as the single most powerful tool to encounter and really correct some real chronic socioeconomic barriers. So um, let's use that as a starting point. So as the minister says, digital India is not for the rich, but for the poor. 
And so this is really about getting the vast welfare benefits, which usually get siphoned off by ghost beneficiaries to the people who need them most, right? China has taken a far more adventurous and far more sort of uh, different approach than India in terms of going for the smart ID by basically connecting different data sets like credit history, behavior habits, financial strengths, demographics, and social networks into a singular reputation score. Now, this basically can help and nudge people uh, into being a good citizen. And that is really the goal for the Chinese state is to create better social behavior online and offline with thinking misogyny, hate speech, et cetera, right? <clears throat> now, it doesn't take much of an imagination to see that what would happen if these datafied systems would get into the hands of authoritarian regimes. In fact, uh, Black Mirror has spared us any kind of amazing imagination by doing this brilliant episode of Nosedive. So if you guys haven't seen it, I really uh, suggest you must. And it's basically about how what would happen if the social credit, credit score really you know, became infused into our day-to-day -day lives. Now, if you start to, if you just Google, right, China social credit score, I can guarantee you that the first few pages will be only about the Orwellian nature of these data fight systems. You are not going to find another kind of story. I mean, India surprisingly has been spared um, much of that sort of Orwellian narrative in spite of the fact that we have a Hindu right government right now in place, and it is becoming far more nationalistic. And if you look at what we're doing with uh, journalists, with uh, freedom of speech, and a number of kinds of uh, measures, we are moving in a very different direction. But people are sort of hardwired into believing that India is the world's biggest democracy, and nobody's going to take that sort of you know uh, you know rubric away. So. Um, now, in order for us to, but you know, uh, go forward with this, we need to also encounter another kind of story, right? For example, a recent poll of 38 countries found that 24% were fine with military rule. 26% found an idea of a strong leader who can make decisions without interference from parliaments or the courts appealing. And 5% of the countries worldwide are liberal democracies. And that's a fact. Um, also, the most comprehensive surveys done on these populations in China and India has showed a very positive response. 70% in China approved either somewhat or strongly about the measures of governance using these social credit scores. And other, it is 87% about mandatory linking of Aadhaar, which is also another name for the unique identity system or biometric identity system. I have no idea why they have three names, but it's all right. It just confuses the matter and makes it seem like they're three different systems. It's just one. All right. So, um, so clearly, how do we put these different sort of one is the moral panic happening in the typical media landscape, particularly generated in the West, and that of these statistics. The quick sort of interpretation we can make is surely with these sort of, um, you know, uh, instruments of datafication comes an entire, you know, uh, paradigm of propaganda and these citizens are getting brainwashed or don't know anything better or they don't realize what their choices are or they do need to be more literate. And if we subscribe to that kind of reductionism, we would be falling to the same kind of paternalistic and condescending traps that we have been trying to you know, debunk and get out of, right? So the paper here really is about, okay, let's take a much more nuanced approach by looking at what is actually going on. What, are the, what is the evidence behind these schemes as it's being implemented? There's an ideal and there's a system in practice. And what is it exactly responding to in terms of the socioeconomic histories and the cultures in question? So I'm just taking three strands from the paper. One is the sovereignty in the Western model of democracy, welfare states and the legacies of information governance, and democracy as a practice. So the first being sovereignty. Now, 
Of course, democracy was a radical and a beautiful political idea of the 20th century. And of course, it was uh, not just an ideal, but a sort of an aspiration for a just form of governance. But it is also worth noting that this de uh, dem democracy project has been driven by Western countries and its institutions, and time and again has been instrumentalized to infringe on the sovereignty of many countries in the global south. So if you are wondering why there's less legitimacy of the de uh, democracy project, this contributes to that. Furthermore, in the last few years, the champions of democracy, which is the UK and the US, have become inward-looking nations that do not want this global leadership to push democracy onto the global stage, and in fact are sort of becoming nostalgic of a fake, fictional, monochromatic past of their lives, uh, which is extremely, you know, uh, disremoved from the deep inequalities and the, uh, you know, chronic violence that they've perpetuated worldwide. So that being said, you add another layer to this is the growing oligarchies in the West as Thomas Piketty has put in his book, which he equals to that of the 19th century. So if this is what democracy looks like, as it plays out to be by the West, then surely the countries outside are thinking differently, that maybe it's time for coming up with their own template and interpretation of what democracy means. And so when we shift gears to China and India, we must understand that India is coming from two centuries of colonial rule by the British, and China from 100 years of humiliation in the opium wars by the British. And with that, after decades, they have found themselves with a newfound confidence and the ability, and most importantly, the aspiration to take the global stage. They want to go viral. They want to take, you know, carve Africa as a continent. They want to be the next colonizers if we have to go to that extreme. So another interesting approach to them is they're not interested in the grand ideals. They're interested in the everyday governance because first and foremost, these are poor countries for the most part. In spite of all the hype around these emerging markets, they are fundamentally still poor. And so governance is the first way to get acceptance from your citizens. So as Fukuyama says, the legitimacy of many democracies around the world depend less on the deepening of their democratic institutions than on their ability to provide high quality governance. And societies don't become trusting because they're more democratic. They become trusting because they distributed their resources more equally. And this is really well worth keeping in mind as to why datafication systems are not looked at in these kind of Orwellian sort of surveillance capitalism apparatuses in the global south as we have come to get used to. Because this goes well to the next point is welfare states and legacies of information governance. Because first and foremost, while in the West, welfare is more of a subset of its general economy, these countries are welfare states because majority of their populations are low income and in need of immediate social services from the government. Okay, so, and Fundamentally, these states are also development states, which means they're very tied to the development project from the post-colonial era, which comes with its own kind of, you know, rubrics of optimism and putting their faith in new technologies for the social good. Now, with India, there's an interesting turn. Surveillance is not necessarily a, d a dirty word, and let me tell you why, right? Because I'm not saying that it's not a critique, but moreover, it is more about turning the lens onto those who are in power, for them to be more accountable to their citizens, much more transparent to their citizens. And so this brings transparency as an idea, as a concept, in a very different light, right? Like, for example, I'll give you one example is the Election Commission. They display all the information of voters, including the caste, religion, age, region, enormous amounts of data, right, of each 
citizen for public uh, consumption under the Right of Information Act. Now, you have to understand these institutions are young institutions that need to build trust among their citizens after colonialism in the, in only decades ago, right? So they're earning their trust by being under the lens. Another very important aspect is the delivery of services across uh, and undocumented populations. For the most part, people do not own a passport and the only form of proving who they are is a, a, the fingerprint <coughs> or a signature. And this leads to enormous amounts of the siphoning of welfare payments to ghost beneficiaries. We're talking about a tremendous waste of resources because in fact, a number of these countries are ruled by informal economies and gray markets. So we are, you know, there are interesting works on rice mafia, border mafia, anti-poverty, fuel subsidies. I, just to give you a statistic, uh, $8 billion is marked for fuel subsidies in India. And that 50% of it is siphoned off to ghost beneficiaries. So we have to understand what these data fight systems are responding to. And this is a challenge that they are facing. So is it so surprising that people would feel a little optimistic about these data fight systems? Because at least it's some measure in responding to these, what seems so insurmountable amounts of corruption, right? Now, in my own experience on the pharma uh, uh, mafia, I, had, I was a, a liaison for a diagnostic software uh, launch in rural Himalayas. And we were trying to populate the database with medical information, treatment, and diagnostics. And what we found was that a, much of the medication, we're talking about 80% of the medication, which was intended to be free and for the poor, was, or before they even reached the institution, the medical institutions that were public, was siphoned off and gone into the private market. So surely we have had cases now and docu evidence in the last decade that with data fight forms of governance, these middlemen have been challenged and to some degree, you know, circumvented. And there's been far more accountability to the citizens and welfare payments going to these people, right? Also, the legacy is not just on, on the development project that I spoke about, but it's not as novel and radical as it appears to be because it is building on e-governance practices, which has been going on for decades. And it's still going on, which is basically digitization of land records. These are very mundane things. We speak about datafication in very grandiose terms. But when we actually look at it, it's absolutely mundane. And it's really about the small little things. Like, can you have an app which tracks whether your welfare payments for your food ration is coming on a day-by-day -day basis so your kids can get fed? Right? Can you see where the vans are going so these sort of mundis, which are like these uh, food mafia, don't take it away so you can track it with GPS? We're talking about really sort of micro implementations in a way that can actually really empower people. And of course, I mean, at this point, I'm not really going to focus on the cons because that's usually what's covered a lot, which is, you know, about uh, chronic power shortages, the computational facilities connectivity issues, structural inequalities, because, and I'll talk a little bit uh, on the, uh, a little later. Le no legal recourse, because you know, these are honeypots, really, because they're convergence and hyper-centralized, and so on and so forth. Um, and in China, the workings of paternalism. Now, we have to also give credit to China that in just less than a decade, they were able to bring Half, I mean, 500 million citizens out of poverty, and that's no small feat. Even more humiliating for India, which is a dem democracy, the world's democ biggest democracy, of course, as you like the byline, is that India just did not fare as well as China. So this normative linkage between authoritarianism and prosperity needs to be also questioned. People don't want to become the US, UK, or Europe in the global south, they want to become a Singapore. And that is the aspiration, right? Um, so when we look at how China managed, it was really about pioneering something brilliant. It's the fintech industry. Because look at the problem they have, right? 
And this is again going back to what are these datafication systems answering and accounting to? We're talking about a communist regime that has that makes sure that people do not have assets, which means banks will not lend to them because they are high risk. So what do you do? Force banks to lend money to them? Or China came up with this idea of third-party payments, peer-to-peer -peer lending, and money market funds combined with the help of Alibaba through Alipay and WeChat, which is enormously popular, right? And because one thing we know for a fact in development economics is people need small amounts of capital to be able to, as the Americans say, pull yourself by your bootstraps, right? And again, that's what they needed, and that's how they managed to get this figure of 500 million people out of poverty in the shortest amount of time historically. And people need to give that much credit to China, right? Now, people are afraid of defending China because it appears like you're condoning and you're actually, in fact, endorsing authoritarianism. And I feel that we need to stop having a black and white conversation here because there's much to learn about fintech and what's going on there. And again, it's not so radical. It's interesting that so much is written about the social credit score, but try looking up Sesame Credit, and you will get, there's no Orwellianness about Sesame Credit. And by the way, that is a foundation that inspired the state to build it upon. And Sesame Credit is pretty much a convergence of different data sets which created the reputation score that allowed people to get these micropayments and thereby purchase goods and service, and that's how the e-commerce industry boomed. And so it is really a sort of data fight loyalty scheme, but it was very instrumental in changing people's behavior, you know, leapfrogging the whole ba uh, banking system and coming up with a new way in which they didn't have to keep lagging behind from the West. And in fact, China is now the leader of fintech in the world, right? And um, right. yeah, and then there's a fo fo we need to focus on enforcement and not just rights and ethics. We're talking about 1.2 billion people, million people do not pay their fines or default on their loans. And for democracy to work, for people to feel it is a fair system, the Chinese system, uh, citizens want it to be enforced. Because otherwise it's really, so the Pianzi, is a, they, and I'm sure I'm butchering it, but swindlers is a huge uh, concern amongst the Chinese. So, and lastly, it's, in this case, these are looked upon as public utility services because we have enormous number of stories on tech oligarchs and that's not going well. And lastly, democracy needs to be seen as a practice. And in the case that these are not monolithic entities, democracy and the datafication systems are playing out differently among different populations. So we're going to have very different narratives and possibly even contradictory narratives. So you can't ask, what do Chinese citizens think? We need to be much more nuanced and say, is it the Hans in urban areas or is it the Uyghurs in certain rural areas? That's a very different narrative, right? Because they're not because they're experiencing the same system. They're experiencing the same system being implemented very differently on these populations compounded with high amounts of vulnerability. So, um, I'd like to wrap up by just emphasizing that we need to move away from these grand ideas and emphasize on the everyday mundane governance because this is their first taste of what democracy looks like to this vast emerging public that has not experienced democracy before and are relatively young to it, right? Uh, we need to really focus on enforcements and outcomes. We need to sort of balance the story, right? We talk so much about rights and ethics and not enough on enforcements and outcomes because there are plural, uh, plural legal systems. There are different informal and formal market systems. Informality makes up sometimes 80% of the economies. These are very different contexts. And we need to understand its complexities. And last but not least is you can't have you know, just uh, techno technological reforms and technological innovations be studied by itself. It needs to be studied in parallel with institutional reforms for us to really understand and gauge what is going on at the ground level. And with that, thank you very much.
And please don't hate me if I remind them what time it is. <laughs> Use your 20 minutes well. That's right. Um, Thomas, do you have like a, do you know where to, oh. is this a view here kind of thing? F5? No. Um, they need to put it in presenter mode. Yeah, I'm just trying to see where there's actually any. It's the S for the keyboard. Let's see. Normally, PDF uh, doesn't show over here. Yeah. What about the three dots there? No, this one? Yeah, yeah. Those may have the options. Yeah. yeah. Is it full? I mean, we need to be full screen. Pin to start? What is that? What pin, is that? Pin to start? What is that? No. In which case, can we scroll it down for each? I could scroll it for you. Yeah, you yeah that's fine. That's fine. All right, how do we get this? Oh. oh, you want to take this to the folio? No, it's okay. If you scroll it down. <coughs> All right, let's, uh, let's start. We have uh, some difficulty getting the slides up. Um, so, so first off, I really want to thank you, uh, the, the organizers, for putting this together. It's, I think, turning into a really interesting event with all of these different disciplines together. And that's also, I think, what we noted, or at least I noted, talking to other people, is that, that we are, we're really at this point where we need to talk across these disciplines, uh, law, media studies, computer science, uh, and uh, I think today that's what we're doing, right? But at the same time, we also tend to, to develop different vocabularies, discourses around the similar issues. Uh, and uh, one of the sort of core uh, questions which I think we're returning again and again to today is the question of democracy and, and governance. And to what extent can we develop forms of governance that are suited and effective in this kind of platform environment, which, uh, which is developing. So um, with having said that, I will cover uh, some of the ground which has already been covered today, but of course in my own language uh, and along my own um, sort of lines of thought. And I hope, um, you know, I can, I can uh, stimulate some new ideas here, but also I hope you can help me from the various disciplines you're working on. So in this, is, in this uh, presentation, I want to reflect on the governance of digital platforms, uh, which I've talked about um, in no, let, uh, just a moment, uh, talked about um, in a recent book we've published, I have it in another slide in a moment, and we looked at the different ways in which platforms become involved in a wide variety of public activities, such as journalism, I've also looked at activism, uh, transport, hospitality, healthcare and the role they play uh, in realizing or undermining uh, the realization of key public values and policy objectives associated with these, such as expression of um, freedom of expression, diversity, public safety, transparency, socioeconomic inequality. Um, so um, with that in mind, the question of governance becomes very, very central. So next slide, please. Oh, this works quite well. So um, my thinking has, on the one hand, been very much informed by my research on public protests in different parts of the world. I specifically worked on Tunisia, Egypt, uh, also in India and China, um, as well as Canada. I worked with data, digital I applied digital methods, and interview-based research. Uh, and what, what that research really shows, and uh, that's, of course, others have done similar work, is evidently that platforms enable uh, user-driven forms of organization and collective action, which has which become hugely important for contemporary activism, in that sense, very empowering. Yet this research also shows 
Um, new challenges for public contestation, especially in terms of undermining the long-term sustainability of social movements, the difficulty of focusing public attention on core protest issues, um, and uh, my research shows the vulnerability of activist social media communication to regime propaganda and hijacking. Yes. So, yeah, that's the book I've been talking about. So, The Platform Society, that's a, a, a more recent uh, endeavor which I undertook with uh, my colleague Jose van Dijk and Martijn de Waal, um, which uh, looks more broadly at how platforms shape public communication activity. And currently, I'm, and that's the, the three terms on the side, currently I'm systematizing or trying to systematize the types of relations and exchanges organized through platforms, which I conceptualize through the notion of platformization, which uh, I guess other people in the room are, are using as well, or maybe criticizing. Uh, we're building there on a rich uh, platform literature. It argues that uh, the platformization brings about fundamental change in three interrelated but distinct dimensions. Each set of changes can be understood both in individual empowerment, um, as I started talking about when related to contestation, uh, uh, but as well, uh, it can be understood as corporate and institutional control. So both at the same time, and these dimensions are, um, and, and many of you have put uh, or talked about these uh, in the same or uh, related terms, um, the development of ubiquitous data infrastructures, uh, datafication cap capturing uh, all, well, many aspects of the social, the making of markets, uh, or stacking of markets and uh, platform markets. We haven't talked that much about it, but um, the ways in which that, uh, that unfolds is, uh, uh, and you can see that in many, many different sectors, is that finance and advertising as particular markets trump over, um, in, in most cases, um, content and service markets. So it has an interesting hierarchy, I would say, in the development of in the ways in which markets become entangled. And then, uh, of course, the development of new forms of governance, particularly important being also the globalization of platform standards, norms, and rules. So even though platforms and datafication play out differently in different sectors, at the same time, we have these platforms trying to roll out these, these global standards. And of course, there's, there's a lot of friction there. Next one. Um, so what I want to talk about is, is really this um, uh, um, platformization allows social actors on the one hand to bypass and undermine traditional intermediaries and public institutions, targeting users with personalized information and services. As such, platform activities and relations tend to evade existing institutional government frameworks, um, which of course these frameworks have a long history of problems in terms of discrimination, censorship, repression, and bias in their own right. So in that sense, there, there, is, there is a form of liberation, yet at the same time, of course, platform activity and relations are not uh, adequately governed uh, by platforms themselves, and in, and in many cases also they translate these older and longer term um, forms of discrimination and censorship and repression to platform governance, um, which we of course heard many examples of today. So constituting global infrastructures, platforms, for example, in a new sphere clearly struggle to take account of the historical and cultural specific importance and meaning of particular content, which was traditionally certified by professional news organizations. So, I mean, there's many examples today already, but I just wanted to pull out two. Uh, one of them we uh, talked, or we actually talked about both in our book, uh, the controversy over... Um, Facebook's unremitted removal of the iconic terror of war picture um, because of, obviously, uh, nudity and, and violence. But after clashing with the Norwegian newspaper uh, over this and a public backlash, uh, Facebook finally gave in and um, uh, allowed the picture on the platform and, and argued we recognize the history and global importance of this particular picture or image in documenting a moment in time. But of course, ironically, uh, that also means that the, the, such a picture taken today could no longer become iconic in the way it has, uh, um, uh, has become iconic um, uh, in, a, in a new system or increasingly dominated by, uh, by Facebook and, and other platforms. 
And particularly, of course, particularly important is also the uh, circulation of misinformation, uh, which is an important issue also in, in the work I do on activism. So platform distribution means that new news and mainstream news organizations appear through the same channels and have the same look and feel as other uh, news from elsewhere. And for a long time, that was interpreted as a democratization. So there's this constant tension between democratization and, and these kind of problematic uh, practices. Uh, democratization of public communication. But of course, we now see that, that also that those affordances allow fringe media, producers of disinformation, propagandists, and, and authoritarian regimes to, uh, to target uh, the public. Yes. Um, and then, and then the destabilization. I mean, uh, there are, there are so many examples, but I just wanted to highlight a few uh, where platforms become in, uh, uh, involved in the urban economy, uh, having a huge impact on, for example, transport and housing, um, um, apartment owners uh, turning into mini hotel entrepreneurs and car owners turning into to taxi drivers without the proper governance instruments in place. So that. To set the stage, um, next slide. Um, governing platforms, then. So, in the light of these problems, um, the platformization of society is considered uh, to generate huge governance problems. Uh, and then the question becomes how can we address these problems? And uh, how can we safeguard key public values? And who should be given the authority to govern? And who is responsible? So, the questions which have, I guess, been on the front of our minds throughout the day. So rather than, of course, giving you a straightforward solution, uh, which I won't be able to give you, I especially would like to highlight why governing platforms is complicated and what is required, maybe, to arrive at a more effective approach. Um, so an important proposal, and here I think we're on, on, on quite familiar, so we've talked about this quite a bit today already. Important proposal to govern platforms is to give them similar responsibility and similar status as the incumbent organizations and institutions in the sectors in which they're intervening. Right? From this perspective, Uber needs to be treated as a taxi company and Airbnb as potentially a hotel business, uh, Facebook and Google as media companies. Uh, so Emily Bell is one of the scholars that has taken this position. But I'm not entirely sure whether that's the best way forward. The problem in doing so uh, can uh, well, most immediately be observed in the information sector. First, I would argue that labeling platforms as media companies would not do justice to the complex interdependence between platform mechanisms, user activity, and content producers. Moreover, it would be a fundamental mistake to give these corporations with strong business objectives and very little editorial expertise, full responsibility for what billions of users get to see. So the blocking of, of the terror of war picture, for example, by Facebook is, a, is, a, is, an, is an example to, to illustrate that. Uh, as well as the many other highly arbitrary uh, editorial decisions and problematic forms of categorization practices by these platforms. So which is obviously not to say, on the other hand, that we have to move to the other extreme, providing platforms with immunity of accountability and considering them as hosts, merely as hosts, um, which Judy, for example, talked about, uh, which would be uh, even more damaging or is more damaging. All right. Um, how about leaving then platform regulation to states which have the legal instruments to force platforms into compliance? And that's the direction which obviously some European states have been thinking about, punishing platforms who have not quickly enough removed particular types of content or removed content which shouldn't have been removed. And this uh, solution is closely related, obviously, to the idea of considering platforms as media companies with full editorial responsibility. That's not just problematic because it doesn't do justice to this fundamental division of labor which I talked about, uh, but it also uh, is problematic because it's based on the assumption that it's self-evident what is exactly problematic content and activity. So returning then to the example of contentious content, many instances of online contentious communication labeled as hate speech, extremist propaganda, and bullying can be interpreted otherwise as well. So as the work on social movements very clearly in illustrates. So uh, some of these movements and, uh, have been um, uh, um, categorized as extremist propaganda. 
and a, and a threat to public safety, whereas for others, there are legitimate forms of public contestation. So in that sense, I think the question of what is actually problematic content isn't simply to be decided either by, uh, by states or by uh, platforms. So let's move on another slide. Yeah. So let's skip that one. So together with uh, Natalie Hellberger, um, we uh, uh, have uh, uh, introduced this notion of co uh, cooperative responsibility uh, to address these problems of, um, of division of labor between different types of, uh, types of actors. So evidently, platforms need to be uh, steered towards behavior that facilitates a form of co uh, collaborative responsibility in which different actors together um, uh, govern a platform. So on the one hand, that means, of course, requiring platforms to enhance their transparency. And on the other hand, and, and we've talked about it already, but there's, there's obviously problems connected to that. On the other hand, it means also empowering citizens and NGOs and regulators to co collaborate in governing platforms um, through data and algorithmic literacy and creating especially also forums through which these stakeholders collaboratively determine the standards on which platform activity is to be governed. And in drawing so, uh, form and, um, and connecting fundamental, and of course doing so, then connect to fundamental historical debates and struggles over social justice, right? So these kind of matters are not to be, uh, they need to be put in their historical context, yeah. Um, so obviously, uh, this is, a, this is a, I don't know whether you can see it from the back, but ba this is a, uh, uh, an illustration from our book where we're arguing, well, these different actors need to be moving towards the center, right? They need to, be, uh, um, uh, they need to collaborate in, in governing uh, these societal relations. But currently, obviously, what we're seeing is that societies are choosing one of these uh, sides of, uh, of the equation, with the US specifically uh, choosing uh, markets and private solutions for these forms of governance and uh, Europe moving more towards the sides of states and publics. So, please, next slide. Um, so while I believe that uh, collaborative arrangements are the way forward, it is far from self-evident that's what we're heading. So clearly, of course, platform corporations have a strong interest in limiting public involvement in how they're governed. Um, but then um, it's just not a matter of platforms resisting uh, regulation, but more generally, uh, the progressively entangled economic interests of all involved actors. And I think that's something which is, has come up quite a few times today and which is very, very important. So in the name of optimization and cutting back public expenditure, governments have actively contributed to platformization by deregulating markets and privatizing public infrastructures. That's most clearly, of course, in the US, but also in Europe over the past four decades. So this is not new at all. Governments have, for example, cut back on public service media, which could play in a very important role in enhancing the democratic character of the information sphere, or what to think about public transport. Um, which has been uh, privatized. So governments have been shifting responsibility from, for governing societies to private initiatives, to the market, and digital platforms appear to be the ideal vehicles of the long -term neo, this long-term neoliberal shift. So in this, in this regard, the governing problem we're confronting is very much the consequence of a larger transformation of governance and the resulting concentration of corporate power. Yes. Uh, many citizens and societal organizations are just as entangled with platforms. So Airbnb, as we all know, and we're all partly sort of uh, um, uh, guilty of this, right, uh, is um, not single-handedly disrupting urban communities, doing so in active collaboration with citizens who rent out their apartments to, through the platform. And similarly, Facebook facilitates the circulation of disinformation with its third party actors, entrepreneurs, political lobbyists, and citizens that circulate this information, and so on. So that simply involving public institutions and users and citizens in governance of platforms won't be sufficient. So that brings me to the last slide. And that's, yeah, that's suggestively called politics. Um, and this is, of course, I'm still thinking about this. So future governance Governing arrangements will need to be based on a new political pact in 
formed by key public values and geared towards reducing the dependence on corporate platforms. And that can't be left to the good and will, uh, goodwill and intentions of one of the core actors, whether it be platforms, states, or uh, citizens. So building such a new pact requires, first of all, of course, a thorough understanding of how platform activity involves a division of labor. It also means, and, uh, but it's obviously not sufficient, enhancing the transparency of how this division of labor is organized and how different actors are involved, of course, including platform corporations, but also a wide variety of other actors. But it also means, uh, free, uh, a public investigation and potential intervention in the political economy and market relations and the legal framework of platforms, which have developed over the past decades. And then finally, a shared commitment to ensure that various stakeholders act in correspondence with core public values. So this is, this is where I am now. And the next couple of years, I'm going to try to develop these ideas further by evaluating different arrangements of governing platforms, both locally on the national level, in Europe and beyond. I would love to hear your thoughts on this. I can pursue this further. So thank you very much for your attention. For you, there's a clicker otherwise. Oh, maybe yeah. oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, for okay. there. It's just because it was, for yours is just oh, a normal. Yeah. Was yeah. Just oh, great. Oh, stupid PDF. Yeah. <laughs> So thanks so much for having me today. And uh, it's really an honor to be a part of this panel and to be uh, speaking uh, cross-disciplinarily. I mean, I really feel that uh, I've drawn so much uh, inspiration from communication studies literature. And I recently, uh, I'm working on a project with Benedetta Bovini uh, on some, uh, what's sort of a follow-up from Black Box Society on, on my side and some of her work on political economy on her side. And uh, this is a chance, I think, to put forward some ideas that these are not ideas that I've developed yet in an article or in a book uh, format, but that I'd love to get your thoughts on and to have further discussions later on in the conference because it's essentially Oops. it's essentially coming out of sorry it's essentially coming out of a um, uh, my concern that both empirical research programs and programs of law reform are potentially presently based on either naive or outdated conceptions mm -hmm. of the political. And that sort of is the motivation for this uh, set of slides. And I think that that, just to be the first person to admit the problem, I think that applied to some of the uh, approaches that I've taken over the past five years. Uh, but I just want to try to ensure that it doesn't further affect um, or too deleteriously affect um, programs in general of reform or of empirical research. So I'll start with just a few ideas about you know, how the fake news debate or problems of the public sphere have been framed over the past, uh, oops, over the past uh, few years or so. And some of them are you know, the idea of fake stories, coordinated inauthentic behavior, as Mark Zuckerberg or the Facebook uh, panels that work on this would put it, um, secret sponsors of content, et cetera, hashtag flooding to disrupt uh, emergent online public spheres or uh, recursive publics. All of those are problems, and you know, one of the things that just keeps coming up in virtually every uh, iteration of the public articulation of these problems is the idea of there's a filter bubble, right? That people are being trapped in their filter bubble. We gotta break that filter bubble. We gotta get them exposed to other ideas because that causes polarization, et cetera, et cetera, right? And part of that also involves, uh, that's vaguely in line with, or generally in line with, calls for a renewed fairness doctrine. And this is something, I mean, that's been a premise of my work since like 2005, since working on some Google stuff and sort of talking about uh, potential bias there, et cetera. But as I started to think about the Fairness Doctrine, I mean, here's a thought experiment for everyone about the Fairness Doctrine and about sort of the filter bubble. Now, imagine you have a situation where you have one group in society, and by the way, I've written this up from the opposite perspective, uh, following Elizabeth Noel Neumann's spiral of silence theory. I've written this up as potentially a, a right being pulled to the left, but let's have this being a left being pulled to a right one, okay? And, and think, for example, also the rhetorical work that I've just done by saying I've, said, I've done it the other way. Okay? <laughs> I have to say from the very outset, as I give this talk, that I'm inspired a bit by the theories of Strauss, about exoteric and esoteric meaning, 
and about other sort of ways in which we communicate and how we must communicate about uh, very sensitive topics in society. So if we have this filter bubble thought experiment, we think about the possibility that you might have groups in society, hey, who are, when they hear about the filter bubble, say, you know what? I've got to listen to the other side. I really need to make an obligation. I'm, I'm obliged as, say, a good liberal to be open-minded and to say, there's people over there that, you know, completely believe for, uh, in, in something that, uh, you know, I don't believe in, but I've got to listen and hear them out, right? And you might have another group in society that says, you know what? We're right. Our people are right. We don't need to listen to them, right? Well, if that's a potential within a society that you have one group that, say, is asymmetrically open to the idea of the filter bubble conditioning its sense of obligation to live the other, listen to the other side, and you have another side that is completely closed to the idea, then this is predictably what would happen, right? <laughs> predictably, that's how things would sort of turn out, that you'd have one side sort of uh, doing that to the, with the other. And, and, you know, and by the way, as, as I've noted about Noel Neumann, I really believe that's one way you could model her spiral of silence theory, which you know, is coming out of a very conservative space within the German Academy. Um, so it's not as if this is just some you know, left-wing doctrine or something, but it is something I think we should think very seriously about. And I think it is a potentially... The deep irony here is that a proposal meant to alleviate polarization could instead contribute to what David Posen and others have diagnosed as deeply asymmetrical polarization. Isn't that troubling, right? Now, just to make it very concrete, you know, just imagining, you know, put it, what to put into the, how to break the filter bubble. Um, if you were in charge of breaking the filter bubble at, say, a given uh, platform or another place, would you say that you needed to inject in, say, a, pr a primarily liberal person, left-wing person's news feed stuff from Fox News? Would you go so far as to go to InfoWars? Say, you know, that they, they say if InfoWars were arguing, boy, Fox News is kind of sold out. They've gone a bit centrist. We want to give do the real, you know, tell the real story about anti-elitism and, and populism, et cetera. Um, would you sort of include um, statistics? You know, how far would you go? And to illustrate that, I mean, there's partially, if you look at, for example, some of the, one of the tweets from Fox News after uh, Obama got in office, and I'll just go right down to the tweet itself to make it larger. Here was an argument made for the Trump economic program that during the first 100 days in office, Obama had lost 1.5 million jobs, whereas Trump had gained 300,000, right? So you could say from a sort of open-minded filter bubblish perspective, we need to get that information into, say, the supporters of Obama or anti-Trump people so they think about what are the arguments on the other side. But on the other hand, you might say, well, from the perspective of someone trying to figure out what is sort of the correct type of information to get into these feeds, that seems deeply misleading, right? I mean, it seems like Obama sort of inherited a big recession, uh, one of the worst in American history, whereas, you know, what a largely... Us one macroeconomic story is that some of the policies put in place were the things that made it possible for there to be job gains in January and February of 2017. So I just wanted to point out that this is really difficult, right? Even though there's such a common uh, uh, recourse to the filter bubble, and I'm not original in sort of critiquing it, but I hope to be a bit more original in the sense of, you know, potentially leading to uh, thinking about what is the theory of politics behind, say, different groups in society. This is um, one sort of a pitch snapshot of different GOP versus Democratic responses to uh, free trade agreements and to certain foreign policy initiatives, um, the latter being pursued both under Trump and Obama, the first being sort of pursued uh, just under Trump with respect to these free trade agreements. And it's very interesting to sort of see that there sort of is a, a potential for a view of the political as being sort of not really a deliberative public sphere, but sort of you, you rally behind your leader. And there's a book by Gabriel Lenz that says that that's how everyone reacts to politics. Gabriel Lenz has a book called Follow the Leader that says that it's not as if politicians are actually trying to find out what the people think and they're articulating that into compelling platforms. His theory of politics is that no, you actually have people who are sort of associated with a party and then do post hoc rationalizations by and large to try to conform their beliefs to what, where the leader is taking the party. Again, if that's your model of politics, it's a quite different model of what any sort of empirical or um, uh, reform program should be with respect to the problems of the public sphere that have been exposed over the past five, 10 years, et cetera. Um, if you were to be very dramatic about it, you might say that there are very rivalrous conceptions of the political public sphere 
that could be sort of summarized into Schmidtian or Habermasian views, right? And the Habermasian view, Habermas here on the left, would be someone who I think would say, by and large, the nature of our political public sphere is to develop common sense of knowledge about what the problems we face as a society are and to develop a common sense of how we can solve the problems. The more Schmidtian sense of politics would be to say, no, the, the nature of the political public sphere is one of contestation, and ultimately the nature of the political is the friend-enemy distinction. And that when we are engaged in politics, we are there to defeat our enemy, and we are there to help our friends, right? And what I think is very interesting is that while in political theory literature, there's a great deal more attention to Schmidtian theory, both on left and right, if you see Jan, Muller, Muller, Jan Werner Muller's book on Schmidt, um, called quite appropriately A Dangerous Mind, um, the, 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 the theory on both uh, left and right in political theory discourse is, is there's a lot looking at the Schmidtian conception. But what does it mean for both communication studies and for programs of law reform in the public sphere if one takes on, say, the model of Gabriel Lenz's Follow the Leader and then intensifies it into a Schmidtian sense that ultimately the political is a realm of friend versus enemy and not a realm of deliberation to develop a common sense and theory of our plight and the problems we face and how to solve them. And by the way, I was inspired a bit to go in this direction for this talk by Will Davies' book, Nervous States, where he develops sort of a very grand narrative, an intellectual historian's narrative of the nature of knowledge and how it's changed. And his story, what essentially has changed about knowledge is that by and large, there was a lot of emphasis on sort of a scientific, during the Enlightenment, a scientific effort to develop together a shared understanding of reality. And that little by little in field after field, the use of knowledge is instead focused to developing a competitive advantage over others, right? That's a really big shift in knowledge, right? If you think, and you see that also, by the way, from a legal perspective in, say, trade secrecy law. Like, we don't say, oh, patent law is actually perhaps something about, you know, developing new knowledge about sight or how to do things, et cetera. Trade secrecy law is just like, does it give you a commercial advantage? Yes, well, then the state will protect it, and it's quite possible we'll protect it forever, <laughs> right? It's quite something. So these, are, these, these different uses of knowledge, I think, are quite important to think about the future of the public sphere. I also just wanted to ground this idea in political uh, economy which is to say that we really have to think about the material foundations of this public sphere, right? It's not just that there are endogenous polit political parties and political currents in society that might trend us toward a Schmidtian public sphere. The other problem is that we have a profit motive toward engagement around what uh, uh, Julie Cohen just called the limbic system, right? The limbic system of uh, communicative capitalism. And, and that I'm also drawing on Jody Dean's great work in blog theory, where she describes circuits of drive. And she says, again, these are, we're talking not necessarily about models of a deliberative public sphere, but we're talking about models of activation of individuals based on emotional appeals. And by the way, this debate goes back also, for example, to the early Obama administration, a debate between George Lakoff and Cass Sunstein. Lakoff said that Obama and the Democrats at the time needed to do more to have emotional appeals and connection to their mass publics. Um, Sunstein said, no, that's really irrationalist and troubling, and what you really need to do is to develop uh, little nudges of people and you know, a rational uh, policy that we can all agree on from sort of a technocratic neoliberal perspective. You know, and I think one side won. But it's very interesting to sort of compare you know, how the political economy of the public sphere may push us in one direction or another. Now, in thinking about academic responses to all of this is that we really have, I think, the proliferation of fake media, of biased media, of, filter, of, of what is called a filter bubble, et cetera, of isolation online. It's led to very different approaches by scholars in the legal profession and by those who are trying to propose reforms. Um, I'll just skip down actually to one thing in terms of competition and consumer law reform. You see these different proposals, for example, to label, monitor, and explain hate-driven results, to ban certain content, to have audit logs and limited annotations, et cetera, uh, media literacy. But I think what I'll leave us with today is just thinking in is this reformist discourse itself predicated on the idea of the Habermasian, 
the Rawlsian, the deliberative democratic public sphere, does any of it sort of matter to the extent we believe we may have passed into the more plebiscitarian, uh, populist, Schmidian public sphere? And I think that that's one of the big problems that we're all going to be grappling with in the law reform community, those who do media law reform, because I think if we don't have the, uh, if our conception of the political is perhaps outdated or perhaps is not realist enough, all of these things are things that can be very easily subverted and can intensify the problems that they were meant to solve. So, thank you. Uh, and I'd just like to check, uh, I know we, we started 15 minutes late. How much time do we have for discussion? Fantastic. Okay. So, uh, comments, Joe? Can, can, you, can you toss that man a mic? Oh, sorry. This is the only one that works. Thank you. I, uh, I hope you don't mind me asking a bit of a critical question about, about the work that you presented. Um, I know something about the social credit system. I don't know much about India in terms of the way you were talking. Um, and I agree that a lot of the way it's been positioned has to do with the fact that and Sesame Credit came out of the same idea that that uh, people were not paying their debts back. It was a whole lot of issues around that kind of thing, and and uh, so that's part of it. And I've read at least in translation uh, the law itself. Um, at the same time, I think what what I got most out of what you were saying was, and this may be the case, that democracy may be an anomaly of the. 18th, 19th, and 20th century, and that maybe in general it will be seen to have been an anomaly in world history. There's nothing to say that democracy has to continue. Um, at the same time, I wonder a couple of things. Uh, the survey, the one survey that I know of that was done that reflects the, the, the results that you said was an online survey of a couple of thousand people. Granted, they argued that it was across the country. I don't know how you, I have enough trouble doing surveys of the American population, seriously. And, and doing a phone survey cost $135,000. Now, a phone wouldn't be that useful except it was cell phone in China. But I have a hard time believing that a 2,000 person China survey about China would reflect what we're talking about. And secondly, um, I remember hearing an academic from China talking about the credit system and saying that the elite are not going to be part of it. That is, and he didn't, he didn't define what elite means, but it's a credit system that is, it is explicitly the people who are elite in the country are not going to be part of that system. Um, and the last thing I wanted to say is that the, the ways in which China is using surveillance is not just through the social credit system, but the way they treat their minorities in a variety of places, including Tibet, including the Uyghur area, which um, people get stopped on the street and asked to give blood donations so that they will be looked at and be able to be monitored that way. So I, I, while we can talk about the rhetoric of how it helps the society in certain ways, and even the notion of whether the government was really responsible for the growth of the Chinese economy, that's a whole other subject. I think we have to recognize there's a lot of oppression that goes on in the course of this. All right, so, no, I, I assume and I expect critical comments anyway from academics, so I'm, I wouldn't excuse yourself next time if you're asking it. But, all right, for, firstly, first and foremost is uh, democracy has multiple facets. And there are certain, I mean, it is a fact that we do emphasize in the West certain aspects of democracy far more than the others. We don't tend to emphasize governance, everyday governance as much, but we do uh, dominate our discussions on freedom of expression, freedom of movement, and certain kinds of conversations. So we need to understand and look at democracy in its widest spectrum, including the rule of law, right? 
I mean, law means nothing in many ways in most parts of the world because it doesn't get enforced. My own family is stuck in, you know, in a, a simple court case for the last 25 years. Uh, delayed justice is no justice. So uh, is India still a democracy? Is it still the world's largest democracy? I can list, we are from an upper middle class family and I am subjected to a number of undemocratic uh, you know, policies and practices, so on my mother, my mother, and so on and so forth. So what I'm saying is democracy needs to be unpacked and which aspects get emphasized by which actors and in who is dominating the conversation and for what purposes. So that is my first question, uh, my first point on that. As for uh, what kind of study, studies, I just outlined a few of those sort of stats. But there are, like, we're not just talking about... Um, uh, the implementation of ses, uh, social credit score, but it's the implementation of e-governance measures, which goes back decades, and the Sesame credit scores. And in and there's a lot of work coming from very excellent Chinese scholars and, um, and who are not defending China in totality. I mean, look, we all know that uh, there are systems of oppression, there are acts of oppression and systems of oppression that are going on, and certain you know, scenarios are being uh, tremendously devastating for certain kinds of population, like the Uyghurs, or like the Rohingyas, or like, you know, so we can just list down, Muslims in India are far more vulnerable now with the new elections, undoubtedly so, right? So exactly what I was emphasizing is that we tend to talk about how is China's system playing out, like, what is happening in China as if it's a monolithic aspect when it's actually happening in zones where they tend to have liberal because of economics, you know, so they have certain zones. They, even in terms of time, when Obama is visiting Beijing, suddenly it becomes more open in certain areas when you're going, like you have access to Facebook. Or like, so it's not just the time with the zones, it's also which people for what services. So all I'm asking, emphasizing in the paper is that we cannot have just one narrative of a system that is not just enormous in its deification uh, implications, but is going to be exported to many different contexts, if not already in process in Africa, right? Based on the Belt and Road Initiative. And we need to look at what aspect, we need to be more critical. We need to harness our intellectual abilities as academics rather than morally condemn them and stop at the conversation of authoritarianism, oppression, because then we lose out on the opportunity to look at the nuances and you know that is on offer. So that's all I'm saying. And I think people stay away from these conversations because they're so afraid of being labeled as a defender of oppressive regimes. And I don't think that's gonna be very conducive because if you talk to people, the average entrepreneur outside in the global south or average citizen, they are very euphoric in some aspects about this because, see, if you're a girl in Pakistan, you may be at, or actually in Saudi Arabia, uh, we, we have some excellent studies on girls in Riyadh, which I've covered in my book. They are able to exercise and self-actualize on YouTube and Twitter in ways that their actual material conditions and their laws and the, 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 the nation's national and cultural morals do not allow them. So, it's all about what are these datafied systems responding to? And it really, that's what the conversation should be. And all I'm trying to do is shift our attention to another area where we can look at, so we can generate and use our intellectual acumen to a much more productive and diverse conversation and not a monolithic, authoritarian, oppressive, or villain conversation of these subjects. Okay, and Mike, yeah, okay, yes. great. Um, I'm currently doing some work on, on um, trying to figure out whether there's something inherent in social media technology that will discourage or make difficult um, central information processing. And so what Frank and also um, Julie Cohen uh, mentioned earlier about the, the limbic system, but especially the deliberative, the, the lack of, of deliberation on social media really resonates with me. And so I have a question in that regard for you, Frank. Um, just sort of, I just want to throw something into your equation and see what comes out. Um, the you, you mentioned the uh, the difficulty of, of of this idea of breaking filter bubbles, uh, which I totally agree with. Uh, 
and you exemplified it by thinking, well, okay, so what about this news story from Fox News? Should we put that in there? What do you think about the, the situation that they have in Europe where uh, the old uh, broadcasters, the old public broadcasters are still dominant in terms of pe people's media consumption um, and that have, uh, you know, a, a mandatory, uh, they're, they're by law required to be as, as objective as they can and, and be uh, unpartisan. Um, you know, what, what happens, can you maybe think of, is, do you have an idea about what, what that does to that dynamic? Um, I think so. I think that this is a, a really excellent question. And I think that part of it comes down to, I'll connect the idea of that sort of dominance to a couple of things. One being in uh, content requirements that some countries say you have to have a like, certain percentage of Canadian content on the Canadian television and uh, Dutch content on the, on the uh, Dutch television, et cetera. And then secondly, to uh, more controversially, some uh, entrenchment provisions of constitutions that outlaw certain parties or allow the government to outlaw certain political parties. And to begin with the content requirements, I think, yes, there's a good argument that in light of what we've seen over the past decade, a stronger uh, sense of cohesion about values that are both to be held dear and those that we would not want to see further disseminated is going to be a bigger part of the media discourse about preserving that. And that's part of why I, I titled my talk Preserving Well-Ordered Societies. And that's moving to a thick theory of, of media regulation, right? The thin theory is there's two sides, give each side, uh, you know, some, uh, or, or maybe there's many more than two sides, but just give each of them some amount of ability to say their piece. The thicker theory is one that would go more towards that sort of value preservation mode. And it also is reflected in ideas or ideals of professionalism and journalism that are themselves under attack because the idea of professionalization is often under attack both from the left and right in terms of the right saying that the market should decide everything and the left saying that the professionalization is a veil or a disguise over what effectively is forms of domination. And I think that we have to think a bit more about, about that. The next I would say is with respect to parties, you know, and you know, the, the bounds of political discourse, there is a really interesting line of jurisprudence in Germany about the potential banning of far right or far left parties. And thinking about that, and obviously I'm not saying this is an American policy proposal because that would be anathema to anything that an American court would allow, but it is something that I think will become increasingly of interest to polities around the world as we see uh, the breakdown of certain norms and as we see the, the ease with which a very effective manipulation program can develop some really uh, out-of-bounds forms of racism, uh, xenophobia, et cetera, uh, very quickly. So yeah, thanks. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's a very, uh, I think, important question. Um, uh, unfortunately, obviously, we're in the situation in which markets largely determine the ways in which uh, uh, 
these platforms operate, right? It's, it's mostly uh, sort of the truth of the market that determines how, how they position themselves. So I think the, uh, we're currently in a situation, right, where the conditions for the type of collaborative or uh, basically democratic uh, uh, forms of organization which are required to, uh, to organize this in a way that in, is in correspondence with the, well, the public values which we hold dear, uh, the conditions for that are not in place, right? So that, and for that reason, I think it's so incredibly important to uh, to understand this within this broader framework of how states are withdrawing sort of from the responsibility, sort of governing societies in their many aspects in terms of also you know providing particular services as as uh, as public service media or as transport or as healthcare. I think in all of these areas, you can see governments withdrawing, right? So, and in that sense, I think that's that's the larger context in which that problem of governance occurs. Um, so, currently, no. So, currently, we're not we're not in a situation in which these corporations can be forced, you know, uh, to comply with these kinds of uh, demands. But so, so if we want to change something about this, whether we're looking at uh, the ways in which the, the urban uh, community is undermined or the ways in which uh, information or disinformation circulates, uh, we will first need to, to, to also address the larger problem of, uh, of how states are, are withdrawing and withdrawing their responsibilities. So, and I think if, if obviously that's why I ended with politics, right? So, so we need a political pact that goes beyond simply organizing platforms or regulating platforms, but that really considers the larger political configuration which these platforms operate. And if we're, if we're addressing that, then yes, then we can start asking questions about how can platforms actually be uh, incentivized, forced, uh, to adopt particular behavior. Yeah. And? Thank you so much, Natalie, and I, I, uh, I've learned so much from your work, and I, I particularly love this question because it allows for, I think, a China-US dialogue here, which I think is really interesting because let's first imagine, I, uh, you might imagine in the US, the ability of a group of people to sort of just be talking among each other, and, to, and, and you can really treasure that in certain, for example, developments of ideology that are way more uh, diverse and pluralistic and vibrant than, say, what I grew up with, right? When I was growing up in, like, the 90s, it was like there were three big television networks, and they'd have kind of like centrist Democrats and centrist Republicans on, and they'd discuss things with each other. And nobody was talking about socialism. Um, also, of course, I don't there, but And there were people, if you look at Kathleen Ballou's uh, history of the alt-right, there were people talking about uh, uh, deeply racist theories, but they were, you know, the question is like how salient were they versus like their ability to have, uh, to get people around now. But I would say that there, and those, that's clearly a, a loss, an epistemic loss and a general loss. But what I would say is that that's really an interesting aspect of filter bubbling, that you could have this sort of development of political thought within a relatively closed community, not held to the need to argue every single one of its points out to some imagined centrist uh, referee of, of on, online debate. But I think that when I, if I were someone who had to try to articulate the rationale for, say, Chinese censorship on Weibo or other places, right, 
lots of censorship, tons of efforts to just stamp out immediately many efforts to organize people. The rationale there might be that if we, are to, if we allow too much of, say, 500, 1,000, 2,000 people to get behind an idea that, for example, there should be a term limit on Xi Jinping, that that could lead to social instability, and that social instability could bring the whole thing down, and bringing down social disorder is worse than authoritarianism, right? And so I think that is really the logic. That's sort of the logic behind a lot of the, the censorship practices there. So I guess the, the advantage of the filter bubbling and sort of the in the midst of a quite open, diverse, and antagonistic public sphere is that of the, forgive the, the, the phrasing, thousand flowers blooming, right? But that on the other side, we're going to see increasing numbers of regimes saying that the risk to social stability are so high, particularly when we think about the types of crises that we're going to be facing over the next decades due to climate change, economic instability, et cetera, that they do not want to risk that. And I bring that up particularly because I just reviewed a book by Balkan and Levinson called Democracy and Dysfunction, where one of the authors says the US Constitution is broken, we need radical change. Balkan says in response, what you need to think about first is how you avoid a total breakdown of social order and massive constitutional change would cause that. So I think that's, you're, you're raising the, the deepest questions. Thank you, yeah. We have a chance to have one more question. Could, could all, there are three people who wanna ask questions, right? Could you all ask your questions and then, and then we'll have a response, okay? You, you, and you. And I'm sorry, hon, you'll have to take it up in, in the reception. Okay, just say, say what your question is. Yes, um, very, very briefly, based on, on Frank's last remark, um, which I find extremely interesting when we are talking about the intersection of communication science and uh, legal studies, mm -hmm. is that before you come up with ideas on, on a media regulation, I have a clearer picture of what the public sphere actually looks like today. My question is, is that maybe a false hope um, that we can have really a clear picture there, that we had a public sphere like that here, and now it's a new um, a pattern, because what we see is that we have non-simultaneous procedures, we have fragmentation, we have hybridization. We see that uh, intermediaries, uh, we do not have a strict link between the service and the communicative practice anymore, and things like that. So uh, is it not the, the question how we can uh, make media policy decisions uh, under these kind of uncertainties and, and multi-faced uh, phenomenon, and not uh, uh, really hope that we get a good grasp on what, what the new public sphere actually looks like. Okay, Usha and Julie, and then I think because our time is running out after you guys open your questions, that is what is going to launch our reception at five. Uh, we will we will have exciting conversations among us about your uh, uh, about how we engage with you. Okay, go, Usha. And Julie. 
Thank you all very much.